Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, uh, Crisis Conversations live from the Better Life Lab. Today, I'm uh, really excited about uh, that the, the people that we have here to talk about family caregiving and family caregivers. Uh, you know, in the United States, uh, one in every five people uh, have caregiving responsibilities or active caregivers, and yet they're really not a whole lot of the part of the conversation. We've been talking an awful lot about uh, parents, rightly so, with uh, childcare and schools closed, and how are they managing in the pandemic? But many, many people care for uh, special needs children, um, uh, people with uh, chronic um, medical conditions, uh, aging loved ones and parents. Uh, it's an awful, there's millions and millions of people, and we really need to bring them into the conversation as well. So today I'd like to introduce our guests. We've got uh, Jessica Mills. She's a family caregiver in Georgia, and she put off her own college plans to care for her mother with dementia. We've got Debbie H Simmons Harris. She's a family caregiver in Minnesota who had to stop working to care for her son who has required complex medical care for more than two decades. We also have Jennifer Olson. She's an epidemiologist by training, and she's the executive director of the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving, or RCI, which promotes the health, strength, and resilience of caregivers throughout the United States. And we also have Karen Lindsay Marshall. She's the Director of Advocacy Engagement and Engagement at the National Alliance for Caregiving, who's been a family caregiver herself. So uh, Debbie, let me, start, let me start with you. You know, one of the stories that, that I have heard as we were preparing for this episode is that many family caregivers are really faced with a really difficult choice, uh, either taking the time that you need to give care you know, or you know, many um, workplaces uh, don't offer the flexibility or support. So it's really a choice, you know, work or care. Yeah, tell us your story and, 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 and when did it kind of start at the beginning, if you will? Okay, well, it was a surprise for us. We kind of entered this journey unexpectedly. Um, our youngest son was born prematurely and um, just seven months, it was seven months long actually, and um, you hear a lot about um, morbidity and mortality in um, African-American women when it comes mm -hmm. to pregnancy and wonder about some of the reasons for, for those statistics, um, the high statistics. And um, in my case, um, it was a situation where I knew that something was wrong, but I couldn't get my providers to listen to me. Mm -hmm. And so when I questioned um, whether or not I should have an additional ultrasound, because the baby had stopped moving and his personality, so, so to speak, had changed. Um, my, my primary physician, or OBGYN, had said that we, I'd already had an ultrasound once, and that's what insurance would pay for it. And so he said we wouldn't uh, try to attempt to have another. So what happened was um, about a day before Josh was born, I had complications went into the hospital, um, an African-American OBGYN had, uh, was on call for our physician's group. And um, he said, if the mother says something is wrong, I, I believe it and, mm -hmm. and, and I hear you. And so when we went in, he set up a bi-level ultrasound, saw that our son, Josh, was in trouble and um, had someone from Mayo rush um, in to um, to actually perform a C-section um, emergently. Um, but just as that was going to happen, um, our physician's group actually came back from a holiday party and they told him he could go. And they told me that um, they would just hold off on everything because um, it was the weekend and they would just wait until Monday when yeah. more departments were open. <laughs> so what happened in the meantime, that day in between, um, Josh went into distress. He had an intraventricular grade four and subdural um, brain hemorrhage on oh. the day in between. And so subsequently, um, he has uh, cerebral palsy, microcephaly, hydrocephalus, global developmental delay, uh, tracheal laryngeal malacia. Um, sometimes I forget all his diagnoses because I don't really think of him in that way because he's a delightful, handsome, content 
young man. But um, basically in our mom's circles, in order to get through this, you have to maintain a sense of humor. So we just call it the works. And so Not he's had work. complex, <laughs> yes. So he's had complex medical needs um, his entire life. We basically had, had a pediatric intensive care unit in our home uh, the okay. entire time. So how and old is how old is Josh now? And, he, and sort of like on a day to day basis, what is it like to what you know? What do you need to do to take care of him? Um, so when we brought Josh home, we were told um, to call the coroner because if we did it when he died, which we were told he would happen uh, two months later, and then they took that back and said it would be two weeks later. Oh, um, um, so that's all the time that we we got. Um, he's actually 27 now. <laughs> so they they so, thought he wouldn't last two weeks and he's lasted 27 years. That's 27 amazing. years. So, so what's, we, what's it like? Yeah. What does it require to take care of him on a day-to-day -day um, basis? So now Joshua is, he has a trach. He has a feeding tube. He's on 24-hour feedings through a pump. Um, he's non-ambulatory. Um, he's incontinent. Um, he doesn't He's not verbal, but he's vocal, so he, he makes um, sounds around his trach, um, and in, in the context of the sounds that he's making, we know what he's saying. Um, he has a very um, interesting and kind of um, unique personality, but he needs suctioning actually 24 hours a day. Mm. Um, he's on about three, four, five pages of medications a day. Wow. Um, he needs to be repositioned every two hours. Um, he is now on a ventilator um, up to about eight hours a day. Um, he needs to have a passive range of motion. Um, you know, it's so funny when you're a mom, you can't even, it's, it's like part of my own body. So mm -hmm. I can't even actually separate it from what, you know, what, from, from my own, act, my own function every day. But, um, he basically needs 24-hour um, high-level nursing care. Um, we don't, you know, with the nursing shortage as it is, there is no way that families have that access to that kind of nursing care. And so my family is trained to, prov trained to provide it as well. So we have two full-time nurses, and we just hired on uh, another part-time nurse, which was a difficult decision in this era of COVID because that nurse also works in one of the main hospitals here in the Twin Cities. Um, so we were that's really- what I, That's what I was gonna ask yeah. you is like, so you've mm -hmm. got all of this, you know, pages and pages of medication, all of this in, intensive, you know, care that, that, that mm -hmm. he requires at home. So what's mm -hmm. it been like during the, the, uh, the COVID crisis? What, what additional um, measures have you had to take, you know, or, or what have you been afraid of because of the, because of the pandemic? It's really a struggle um, because to fill in those 24 hours, you know, we just, we have nursing, we don't have any nursing on the weekends for the most part. So it's family just rotating those 24 hour rounds, my, my sons, my husband and myself. And um, so we, and then the nurses that we do have are just like day, one night nurse and, and then one daytime nurse for four, four nights a week and four days a week. And then we fill in the rest. And then my brother was helping us out and the, the anxiety that it was producing to have so many people mm -hmm. coming in and out of my home and then wondering like what everyone's exposure was when they were away from my house and knowing that every contact that every single person made outside of the home was another risk of exposure for Joshua. Mm -hmm. And he has so many access points that we don't think about. He's got a trait. Right. You know, he's, yeah, and, right. and he's got a history of um, a, a respiratory history that is just extremely labile. So he's, um, he's just at such a high risk and he's so medically fragile. Right. And in addition to that, my husband um, is a career Marine and was exposed to Agent Orange. And so because of his exposures, he has a, a long list of, um, of conditions that put him in every single risk category as well. Wow. So, so Debbie, let me, let me really come back difficult. to you and let me come back to you in just, in just a little minute, in, in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when we talked before, you were talking about, you, you know, you had been working and this is something, you know, that your, your income was really important to your family. And then yeah. when Josh had such intense medical needs, 
you were faced with a choice of, a, of you know a workplace that really didn't understand or accommodate you um, and so you've been you, you you made the choice for you know the only choice that you could um, Jessica let me turn to you you know you were also faced with a difficult choice when it came to um, thinking about you know being a family caregiver you know can you tell us about your your choice um, you know and and the and then and then how how COVID is also impacting uh, your caregiving. Yeah, so um, thank you for having me. I have been taking care of my mother. She has dementia for about the past 10 years now. Um, I'm 29 years old. So this started when both of us were relatively young. She had just turned 50. Um, mm -hmm. I had just moved away from home after graduating high school to start college. Did about two years of school before we started noticing that mom was having issues, remembering little things like where she put her keys, things like that. I mean, she was still working full time. So I eventually moved back to help her navigate just the whole process of even getting the diagnosis. Because like I said, with her age being only 50, dementia was the last thing anyone was expecting. Right. So we had to go through a whole range of tests and whatnot to rule out everything else pretty much before we said, okay, yes, this is what we're dealing with. And from there had to decide, okay, so how are we going to manage that? Um, and I've I'm an only child, so between my dad and I, we decided and have been very fortunate to be able to care for her in the home. Um, and that's what we plan on doing for as long as possible. Hopefully, you know, that's our plan is to take care of her in the home because I know she's in the later stages now and isn't able to communicate or like Debbie was saying, she's non, she's not communicating, but she's vocal. She's, you know, mm -hmm. she'll still, she has ways of letting you know what she needs and it's hard to know what somebody's needing by that unless you really know that person so we really knowing her as well as we do we're able to give her such great care and keep her at home with us where we know she's comfortable and she's happy and it's just like i said we've been very fortunate to be able to do that so far but my dad had to go into early retirement um i worked as long as i could part-time until her needs just became where she's needing care 24 7 and neither one of us can work now um, mm. And that's even with having hospice nurses and whatnot coming in a couple times of the week. It's just still a lot of the care falls on us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's difficult. So, so how are you, how are you able to survive? How are you able to kind of like make ends meet and, you know, particularly now with the pandemic raging? So for the past, I haven't been working in the past two years and we were lucky enough to have savings that have gotten us through um, and that's just not, unfortunately, not going to last much longer. Um, so I have been looking into, I've started school again online and I'm looking into however I can get back into the workforce in whatever way possible, um, just to help. Because if I'm, if there's some sort of income coming in from me, then we can, you know, potentially hire more help. And then that just relieves the strain on both me and my dad and just makes everybody's jobs easier. Mm. Um, so, Yeah. So, so Karen, let me, let me turn to you at this point, you know, I, can you help put Debbie and Jessica's experience as sort of in a broader context? You know, um, Jessica talks about how, because the care, you know, they're, they're relying on family savings, but you know, you, there's other research that shows that so many American families, they wouldn't even be able to scrape together $400 in an emergency. You know, that's, uh, you know, that, that's quite a bit of a burden that, that, um, that we're placing on a lot of families. Can you, can you help um, kind of paint the, the larger landscape of kind of what family caregivers are, uh, you know, what, do they, what are their challenges um, before COVID and now during COVID? Uh, thank you, Bridget. Yes, um, so much of what you said, Jessica, and what you said, Debbie, resonates with both me as a family caregiver, a former family caregiver, and the caregivers in our advocacy network. Um, so thank you for sharing those those deeply personal stories. So many elements like of those stories, like I said, resonate across the caregiving spectrum, spectrum from the types of tasks that you have to help perform, like medication management, which is a very difficult job, complex nursing duties, coordinating care, and most of 61% of caregivers are in the workforce, so they're doing all of these things while they're also trying to stay employed. So there's no wonder that caregiving has a huge impact on an individual's personal health, their mental health, as well as their financial health. So a lot of times I think we think of caregiving as a personal issue or a family issue, and it is. It's deeply personal, and it is something that is very multi-layered 
with the caregiver's experience, the experience of the care recipient and other members of the family. But it's also a public health issue, mm -hmm. um, which is why now, especially in the time of COVID, it's so important for us to, to look at these issues. And fortunately, and I, I say that ironically, um, the pandemic has pulled the curtain back to reveal so much of what caregivers have been going through, both mm -hmm. before and during COVID. So if you imagine these issues that both Jessica and Debbie just mentioned, their experience in them both before COVID have began a few months ago and now, and that's the same for caregivers across the country, um, 53 million caregivers to be exact, according to research that we recently um, published with, the, um, with AARP. That research was pre-COVID data. With everything that's going on, the number of caregivers is increasing and it could be expected to increase. And so can the personal, mental, and financial health issues that I just mentioned. Right. So Jennifer, let me turn to you at this point. Um, you know, this is, this is an issue that you've been looking at as an epidemiologist, but also this is something that the, the Rosalind Carter Institute has been um, very deeply involved in. Can you talk some, uh, you know, again, about some of these broader issues, how COVID is playing out and the, and the work of the Institute? What are, you know, um, kind of what are you all looking at and, and most concerned about right now? I think the biggest area of concern right now from the caregiver landscape is exactly as Karen brought up and Jessica and Debbie are highlighting, caregivers are not seen as a constituency the numbers of caregivers continues to grow. And yet uh, when you think out on a website, caregiver support, it's usually the sub part on a menu rather than being kind of the dedicated focus. We think of caregivers as a critical element for our social se sector, our healthcare sector. And yet we don't see very many opportunities where the caregiver is the center of that conversation. They're usually the afterthought. Hmm. So can you talk a little bit of, you know, I know that you just recently wrote a letter to Congress talking about some of the challenges that caregivers face yet kind of in this immediate era area, you know, with the, with, the, with the pandemic and what they really need. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what do caregivers, family caregivers, what do they need, uh, you know, to get through this, uh, you know, this pandemic and, and, and kind of what do they need long term? I think there's a few categories. The first being uh, caregivers conditions, mental health and physical health needs to be uh, an area of concern. How often ask Jessica and Debbie if when they go to the doctor's office, if the doctor ever asks them if they're a caregiver, you get asked questions about how, you know, how much you're sitting during the day or if you're eating the right fruits and vegetables, but we know that caregiving impacts people's health. As Karen said, physical health, mental health, financial health, and yet we don't engage in those conversations. So what we see in COVID is a chance to bring the caregiver conversation out. Mm -hmm. The example I've been giving is at work right now, people are talking about in their virtual ways or when they're talking to coworkers, you're more comfortable to say something like, oh, I have to go pick up groceries for my loved one, or I have to take care of, you know, get a prescription for my grandma. That's becoming a more of like water cooler, although in the realm of Zoom, maybe water cooler isn't the right frame, <laughs> but uh, the water cooler conversation, you know, how can we continue to get that conversation out and to say these issues are, exist, caregivers are part of every community you could think of, every sector group you could think of, there's caregivers in that community. Every employer has caregivers mm -hmm. in their workforce. Every store has caregivers shopping in their aisles. You know, do you think that it's something that we haven't paid a lot of attention to because there is this assumption, you know, kind of through the years that, well, somebody's just at home taking care of them, sort of like this old kind of kind of an outdated breadwinner homemaker notion that they're like, I think Heather Boucher says the American wife or, you know, there is sort of like the woman supposed to be at home. And, and of course, we know that was never true for all families in the United States, but that within policymaker circles, um, you know, that that is a notion that's stuck. Do you think that that's part of the reason why, uh, you know, these issues have not been sort of front and center until now? In some ways, be yes, because the word caregiver conjures up a vision in a lot of ways of a, an older person, usually an older woman taking care of an older man mm -hmm. and uh, a kind of very distinctive visual of like, oh, that's the support that's supposed to happen. Whereas 
as we continue to hear, the caregiver story is part of a variety of stories um, and people are coming up with new and different ways to be distance caregivers, to care for their uh, the person they have a divorce from. I mean, caregiving is kind of transforming right now um, in a way. And, and I think the image that people have in their mind is that is that kind of single image of what it means. Mm -hmm. And and I think the tasks are changing. You know, I think um, people think of kind of tucking someone in or cooking them a meal uh, as kind of these very discrete tasks, but you've heard there's obviously really complex medical tasks. Absolutely. There's uh, There's tasks related to protecting someone from financial fraud. There's all sorts of elements of the work. Mm -hmm. Up and modifying somebody's home. I mean, I think it, the tasks are changing, the functions are changing. And caregivers are 3D beings, and we kind of continue to have a one-dimensional view. So let's, you know, so Karen, if I could go back to you, you know, um, so what are some things that caregivers really need if they've been sort of this invisible force that we've all relied on? Um, you know, I, I think in, in the um, the report that, that you mentioned with the AARP, there's discussions of, you know, workplaces and work cultures need to be much more um, flexible and uh, able to adapt to people and their caregiving needs. You know, when you just look at public policy, we don't support families very well in this country. And even the emergency paid family leave bill uh, that Congress passed, it exempted, uh, you know, people like Debbie and Jessica. You, you don't get paid family leave or in, uh, under the, you know, the emergency provisions. So Karen, what are some things that, that, that family caregivers um, really could use? And like, you know, how do we make them more visible, but also how do we create the supports that they need? And Debbie and Jessica, I'm gonna ask you the same questions in just a moment. So we'll be thinking like, what, do you, what is it you need? Well, according to our research, 45% of, um, of caregivers report having been financially impacted by caregiving. Um, and like I said, 61% uh, work in addition to their caregiving. So it's very important that in addition to uh, policies like the paid leave um, policies for family caregivers that we've been talking a lot about, especially during the, um, the COVID area, that we look at a comprehensive package of financial and workplace supports that can help family caregivers. And they can range from paid leave to tax credits for expenses that um, associated with caregiving. Um, and they can even go beyond things like taxes uh, and tax incentives to employer culture. Um, mm -hmm. These conversations that Jennifer mentioned around the water cooler, they need to continue. We need to recognize caregiving as a, by, as a very important role in our society that really contributes to the fabric and structure of how we live. Um, and that goes for you and me, that goes for our coworkers and our employers, our neighbors, and it also goes for us within the caregiving community. The more that we can self-identify and think of ourselves as more than, oh, I'm, my, I'm a daughter. In my case, I was a daughter, and my caregiving was part of my responsibilities as a daughter, which I cherish very much. Mm -hmm. But it's very important to also think of myself as a caregiver who plays a role in a public health system, who has a seat at the table when health care decisions are being made. And it's mm -hmm. so important for people on the other side of that table to recognize that role. Right, that you're, that you're an active, active part of, of whatever plan. Uh, needs to happen. So Debbie, um, you wanted to talk a little bit about acute care. Uh, can you talk about that? And then also, you know, from your, from your role as a caregiver, what do you see? Like what needs to happen? What, mm -hmm. uh, how do you need to be supported? Mm -hmm. how, what would help you overcome some mm -hmm. of the challenges that you've been facing? I, I think there's a, a profound need to profile our stories because I don't think people realize um, in addition to the weariness and there is joy in all of this too, because um, it, it, it impacts our lives so profoundly um, and, and expands our lives so profoundly. So that, that aspect needs to be shown too, that there's a weariness to caregiving over such a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but then as well, there's an entire population of us who start when, with our children who are considered chronic care but they're kind of the, Josh is like the first generation because of technology um, who are con acute care, but have lived as long as chronic care patients. So, mm -hmm. so, so in addition to the custodial care that, that we provide, um, there are days upon days where um, 
you're doing like high level nursing assessment and interventions that would be done perhaps in an intensive care environment. So um, he, he might have, a, because of his autonomic dysfunction, he might have a heart rate of 34 at one part of the day. And then maybe an hour later, it might be 180. Wow. And so there are assessments and interventions that you have to do and decisions you have to make, especially now in this era of COVID, because you don't want him to go into a hospital. Yeah. And there are a lot of issues about transition where we don't know really where to even take our, our, our kids who are kind of in between where they've only been at children's hospitals. And we don't know what adult hospitals will you know, we don't know where to take them because they don't know them there. Yeah. And so I think there's a, a profound need to profile our stories and educate people about who we are and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis because it is so challenging. Yeah. And when Josh was born, it was the same time that the Family Medical Leave Act was, was, um, was uh, in, legislated. And so... Um, we're, here we are, we're still fighting for paid medical leave. And mm -hmm. at the time, um, I, we, my family was trying to go from uh, two incomes to one income, which was pretty financially devastating. But I carried the, the main insurance to provide for Joshua's needs. And my husband worked on contract. And then finally, um, just at shipping away as much as we could by my taking time off, to be at the hospital with him because he had 10 surgeries the first year wow. um, and, and countless hospitalizations for respiratory infection and other illnesses. Um, we just had to make that jump and I had to, I had to resign from my job. So like Karen was saying, we're such a huge part of the entire healthcare system and we're, pri we're providing such a valuable aspect to the, to the, the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. So we need to be profiled and we need to be supported. Um, and when we say monetarily, it's not that we're trying to exploit the system, but we need to survive. Right. And we need, and we need morally to take care of, of our citizens who are vulnerable and need to be taken care of with dignity. So Jessica, you know, talk about in, in, you know, um, in, in your situation, you know, what do you, what would you need or what, you know, what would help support you and your family and the caregiving that, that, that you're giving to your mother right now? So what I really hope that people take away from conversation, I think conversations like this are very important. Like definitely this is a start and I'm very excited to be a part of it. And I hope that people take away just, just a better idea of the overall scope of challenges that caregivers do face on a daily basis. And especially as Debbie mentioned, when it's carried out long term. Um, but just exactly like she said, I think a lot of people know about the negative sides of caregiving, but there's so many positive and rewarding things that come with it as well. So I really do want people to be aware of that so that they're maybe not so afraid if they ever have to be, you know, think, hey, do I need to take on caregiving for a family member or a loved one at this point? I think maybe if they knew that there was enough support and resources out there that maybe they would be more willing to take on that challenge. Um, because I know things specifically like RCI has been just an incredible wealth of support for me specifically to take care of myself. You find a lot of how to be a better caregiver to the person you're taking care of, but not so much of how to be a better caregiver for yourself and so for you other caregivers. Us, no, I was just going to say, tell us a little bit about, so what, you know, what kind of, what are you learning through um, RCR? What, you know, kind of, how is that supporting you? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that work. Yeah, so it's, um, you get a coach, and I think coach is the perfect word for it because they were like exactly what I needed at the time. I didn't, I wasn't even aware that I was needing that kind of support for myself, but once I started meeting with my coach, she would remind me, you know, hey, it's important to take care of yourself and just suggest like stress management techniques and things that you would never think of for yourself because you're so busy focused on the person that you're taking care of. You, it's easy to neglect yourself, mm -hmm. and so I really needed that reminder, especially during the time of COVID when everything, you're just kind of, everything's going crazy and you're just worried about taking care of your loved one and not so much thinking about your own health. So having that reminder was very nice. Um, just mm -hmm. reminding you, hey, take a deep breath every now and then, you know, eat healthy, do some exercise. Kind of like you're mentioning as far as like doctors don't necessarily look at that side of caregivers, you know, but it is very important that caregivers take care of themselves so that they can continue to be effective for their loved ones. 
So, uh, so Jennifer, kind of what are some what are, what are some so, some of the stories that you're hearing during COVID from you know so many of the different coaches and the the different family caregivers that the the institute does work with and does does look to support. I think a lot of our caregivers are saying that the skills that they need as far as problem solving um, and engaging in or connecting with family and friends to build a support team are as critical now as ever. Caregivers have often been some of the most resilient and creative problem solvers uh, in this country. And I actually think there's a moment to say, well, we could learn so much from the way caregivers adapt to challenges. I think there are people who see that caregivers are existing in this challenging environment every day and could be an example in the way that they have adapted, they've handled, they've, they've multitasked. I mean, when you listen to any caregiver story, you think, wow, you've got a lot on your plate and yet you're still doing an amazing job. So um, I think there's some opportunity there. And then, you know, what would they, what would caregivers need to make that juggle and all the stuff that they do have on their plate? What would, what do they need to make it, uh, to make it easier? Or as Jessica says, you know, to, to make people not so afraid of it or even choose it um, willingly. I mean, I'll go with something Mrs. Carter reminds me all the time, which is most important thing you can do for a caregiver is to check on them. I think we all all know at least one caregiver in our life right now. Even our caregivers who are on this call could probably think of one other caregiver. Um, and they could all just use somebody to just say they're, you're there for them um, and whatever that means in that, in that time. Not ask them what you can do for them, but just say that you're there. That's mm -hmm. the best thing you can do. So, so we're coming down on time. So Debbie, I'd like to come, come back to you, give you the last word. You know, when we're talking about what caregivers really need, um, you mentioned that when your son was born, that's when the Unpaid Family Medical Leave Act passed. And here we are at 27, and there's still no paid family leave. What else, you know, and you had to leave your job. What would you like to see in the future? What needs to happen? You know, kind of think big for, for someone in your, you know, that might be in your position, you know, 10 years from now. What needs to change to make their, you know, their situation easier or better? Um, <clears throat> I think for, for us, and, and, I, and I'm just speaking from our situation and what would have made our lives easier, um, in addition to just fighting for Josh and to, you know, learn how to take care of him to, to save his life and, and to make his life comfortable um, and to normalize life for our other children, um, it seems like it was a full-time job fighting to keep benefits and to get benefits. It was a full-time job and it was a, a serious struggle to keep insurance and to get nursing care and to um, just get the resources that we needed to maintain all of this and to keep him at home and to get supplies and equipment. All of it is so tangled up in bureaucracy, bureaucracy and questioning of our intentions and it's all so difficult and there has to be a way to streamline that and um, and also support families with um, some type of a compensation for caregivers because that I think has made our lives more difficult than the actual caregiving part you know the actual hands-on caregiving because you learn you learn the person that you're caring for and that becomes part of you and becomes natural even though it's often scary. But the part that you never get used to is this other part, the full-time job of trying to access resources and to continue to fight for what you need to keep this whole machine going. Mm. That's really hard. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you all so much for joining us today to have this and this really powerful conversation, hoping to bring some visibility to family caregivers who for, like you say, 53 million who for so long have been so invisible. So thank you to our uh, wonderful panelists. Thank you to all the participants. Uh, I see that there are some resources in the chat. Um, we'll make sure that we send those out as well. Um, I'd also like to thank the New America Events team, the Better Life Lab team, our producer, David Schulman. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about um, 
a, a really exciting and interesting behavioral science project uh, looking at work-life conflict and trying to design interventions to uh, ameliorate it and, and how that's translating into the era of COVID. So in the meantime, wash your hands, stay safe, wear a mask, and we'll see you next week.